Well, I did um, classics and law at Cambridge. I switched to law uh, in my final year and had every intention of becoming a barrister. Right. Whilst I was at Cambridge, I had been interested in doing the sort of civil service exams. And unfortunately, I broke my hand playing football uh, while I was here, and I couldn't take the exams. And so I'd always thought that it would be a nice thing to do because I sort of enjoyed that sort of thing. And uh, so whilst I was doing the bar exams, I took the, um, the civil service exams and applied to the Foreign Office. Well, I don't think the two things are incompatible. Of course, we want a political solution to the situation in Yemen. And there will, I mean, a bit like Syria, there will only ever be, in the end, a political solution. But that does not mean that we are neutral in the conflict between the legitimate government of Yemen, as represented by President Hadi, supported by the region, including Saudi Arabia and many of the Gulf states, and the Houthis, who are... Uh, have broken out of their area of Yemen, taken over the capital by force, and essentially had a military coup. Um, and we resist that. It was opposed by the Security Council as a whole, unanimously, including Russia and China, supported the legitimate government of, uh, of Yemen, uh, headed by the president. And we therefore consider the intervention by Saudi Arabia and the coalition as a legitimate one. And in those circumstances, there's no reason why we shouldn't provide them with weapons, which incidentally are all precision weapons, which helps them to avoid civilian casualties, um, but to prosecute the conflict, to persuade the Houthis to come to the political negotiation And there was table. a very emotional moment at the UN Security Council, probably the most sort of emotional moment I had in my five years there, when uh, the Libyan ambassador essentially defected live you know, before TV screens in the Security Council. And a man who had defended Gaddafi two days earlier said he has now gone too far. He was someone I was at school with, he was a friend of mine, but he is now killing his people, and I beg you, the international community, to intervene. Mm. The legal basis for that was, was twofold. One is the national defense of the United Kingdom, so the national security under Article 51, which was the case for, for instance, the... Uh, strike that killed Riyadh Khan, who was actively plotting uh, terrorist activity in the UK. And secondly, the collective defense of Iraq, because Iraq had asked member states to come in and protect... You see a lot of threats that. coming to the table every day. Um, where, where are we looking? Where is, where is the, the biggest threat to our national security? Not sort of global security, but British national security. Four main threats. Um, one, terrorism, and particularly the rise of Daesh, which is, you know, ISIL, which is new since 2010. Um, secondly, uh, what is called state-based threats, but particularly Russia, um, because of what they have done in Ukraine and are now doing uh, in Syria. Um, third is cyber, uh, which has always been a threat, but is a massively increased threat over the last five years. And lastly, the erosion of the sort of international rule of law order, which is around the United Nations precisely, and the sort of undercurrent of countries that want to flout that order. And there are certain countries that have done that. So those are the main threats to British security. Of course, we have a risk register which covers a whole range of things like nuclear attack and biological attack and health um, uh, pandemics and things like that. But those probably are the four top threats. Um, there's been quite a lot in the news recently about Julian Assange after the UN report about his arbitrary detention, whatever that means. And we had a debate here in the Union about him last term as well. Um, I wondered what your thoughts on, firstly, his situation in the um, Ecuadorian embassy are, and also um, perhaps on whether he still, and people like him, still pose a threat to national security. Well, not to the extent that it's been discussed by the National Security Council since I've done this job. It's not an issue that takes up a lot of uh, government time. But the government's position, uh, I can explain, is that we have a duty under the European Arrest Warrant to uh, hand over Julian Assange to Sweden because there are outstanding uh, accusations of rape and sexual molestation um, outstanding in the Swedish uh, judicial system. So in a sense, we are 
caught in the middle of this with a sort of innocent party in this. He so happens that he's taken refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy, and if he comes out of the Ecuadorian embassy, we will be obliged to hand him over to the Swedes. My personal view is that, you know, Assange has done something which has been extremely damaging to national security. You know, the WikiLeaks is great if you're uh, a journalist or maybe even if you're a member of the public, but there are some things that it is important to keep secret. Um, and unfortunately, um, that hasn't happened. You know, Snowden signed a confidentiality, you know, the equivalent of the Official Secrets Act in America. I don't know what it's called in America, but no doubt there's an equivalent. When he joined the NSA, he breached that contract. That's illegal, obviously, in the United States. Um, and he should return to the United States to do that. If he has the strength of his convictions and he feels that it was the right thing to do to release all these this secret information, he should be prepared to stand up and and have his day in court and be, and be punished. All I can say is I've never regretted the career choice I made because, you know, when we get together with all my friends from university, all they want to talk about is what I do and not wh what they do. <laughs> because it is, you know, fascinating and, you know, you do meet the most incredible people. And, you know, one of the weirdest events I've ever attended or meetings I've had was with Prince Charles... Mandela and the Spice Girls. <laughs> <laughs>